Welcome to thewordmadefresh.org. We are visiting with Dr. Howard Eddington, whose hundreds and hundreds of sermons are the very lifeblood of this website. Howard, thank you for joining us today and for sharing your incredible collection of sermons with all of us. Thank you. Please tell us a little bit about your family history. Do I understand correctly that you are a fourth generation preacher? That's correct. I, there's a sense in which I guess you could say I went into the family business uh, because not only are there four generations, but then there are aunts, uncles, cousins, and everybody else that kind of spread out through the network of the family. So I've been surrounded by ministers as long as I can remember. Wow. What was it like growing up with a father and a grandfather as a preacher or being the preacher's kid in your hometown? Being the preacher's kid was uh, occasionally a bit of a challenge. Uh, I had friends who loved to make fun of me because of that role that I played as a PK, a preacher's kid. Uh, but in general, it was quite wonderful I, because I was always in the company of people who were really wonderful Christians and who loved the Lord and who loved me as well. And therefore, it was a kind of a happy circumstance in which to grow up. And I look back on it with great fondness. So when did you first believe that you wanted to become a minister? Actually, uh, that was due to my wife, Tricia. In college, I majored in history, was interested in coaching basketball, and that was where I was focused. And then I started dating her midway through my senior year in college, and she had a great faith, and she kept peppering me with questions, and I found it hard to answer them. And so as I wrestled with what she was putting before me, I realized that there was a sense in which that sense of call to the ministry had been there all along, but I'd kept it buried and submerged and she brought it out. And that was when I made the decision right then that I would go on uh, to seminary and ultimately then into the ministry. Well, now a lot of ministers do go to seminary schools as you did mention you had done, but not many go to Scotland as part of their educational process. Why did you do that? I did that for a very specific reason. One of the, uh, the basic truths of the school that I attended in Scotland, the University of Edinburgh New College, that their emphasis on the scriptures is absolutely superb, was then and still is to a great extent. And I felt like I needed a deeper dive into the Bible and into what the Bible uh, had to offer in terms of the preaching ministry. Fortunately for me, I studied there under Dr. James Stewart, who at that point in time was recognized as one of the greatest preachers of the 20th century. A, a real, a small, gentle man, but when he spoke, oh my gosh, you could feel the Lord. And when he spoke, either in the classroom or in a pulpit, there was always dead silence. People were just drinking it in. And so I lived under his love for the Bible, in particularly the New Testament, and his love for Jesus Christ and marinating in that for that period of time was exactly what I needed. So what was your first position in the ministry? My first pastorate was in Kilgore, Texas. Wonderful church in a little town right in the middle of the East Texas oil field. In fact, at one point, uh, that church had nine oil wells around the property and they pumped the oil out so fast that the church fell in and they had to build a new one in any case, but by the time I got there, the oil royalties were no longer there, but a wonderful church was there, and it was a great place for me to begin. They, they loved me, they loved Tricia, they loved what I was doing. I think they regarded it as their responsibility to somehow grow up this guy and to be a minister of the gospel, and they took that seriously, and because of that, and because of what they had to put up with me and my immaturity at that point, I regard those folks as being guaranteed entrance into heaven. <laughs> but in fairness, you didn't come in as the number two minister. No, no. It, that was, I was a solo pastor there. Wow. Were you nervous? Yes. Um, and, and that nervousness has never left, in a sense, uh, all these years later. I, I recognized that I was, it was a significant church. It was not just a, a small congregation. And because they were so aroused by their own faith in Christ, they just were exciting to preach to. And so I would approach the pulpit every week thinking, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this? Uh, but they kept encouraging me and loving me and 
wiping away my insecurities and imperfections. And as a result, I look back to them in gratitude for who I am today. So what was it like when you went up there on the pulpit for the first time to preach your first sermon as the lead pastor in such a distinguished church? I will tell you very simply, when I stepped into the pulpit, I looked up and over the balcony was a huge stained glass window with a magnificent representation of Christ with his arms stretched out and underneath were the words, come unto me. And I knew then this is where I need to be. So Howard, can you share with us how you prepare a sermon? You've given hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. Do you have the same process? Yes, but it was a process that I came to after being in the ministry. The funny thing is that the first Sunday after I preached in Kilgore, I felt like I'd done a nice job and I was okay with it. But then I went home and I suddenly thought, what am I going to say next week? I said everything I know this week. What do I do now? Well, that kind of continued for a time. And I realized if I can't find a way to address that, I'm going to burn out or something worse. And so I had to develop a different system. And it evolved over, over a period, not too many years, but over a period of time. And what I began to do was, and let me try to put it as succinctly as I can, every year in the, in the course of my pastoral work dealing with the people in the congregation, I would listen to the things that they said. I would hear from them concerns in their life. I would hear from them questions about the Bible. And all of those things, I would make notes. And I would drop them into a file. In the summertime, I would pull that file out, and then I would sit down for two weeks in the summer, right here at Montreal College, every summer, and I would spread out all of those concerns that had been lifted up from the people to whom I'm preaching week after week, and then I would lay out the basics of the Christian year and try to fit some of those things into that skeleton. Then I would go to do the biblical work. I would find biblical passages that I felt addressed the kinds of concerns or needs or wants or desires that I heard from my people. And then I would do the basic biblical work, write that down, have I develop a kind of an outline for a sermon. And then this is critical. And I did this not for the congregation, but for me. I tried to develop a catchy title. The reason for that was I needed to have something in my mind that I could hang on a particular sermon because then I would take a manila folder and put that title on that manila folder and put it aside, put in there the biblical work that I'd already done. And then as the year unfolded, and I would do that for a year at a time. And the, the other benefit was I was able to publish that list for the congregation for the whole year. So they knew where the sermons were going and it gave them an opportunity to kind of study along with me. But as I was reading, well, the newspaper or Sports Illustrated or a theological book or what the Bible itself, I would take notes and drop those into the specific file or folder for a particular sermon. And as a result of that, I was amassing a number of pages of material each week. Then, and this is critical for me, I would deal with three sermons at a time. The beginning of the week, I would pull out the folder for the sermon three weeks from now. I would look at it and see it. Is that still a viable sermon? Is the biblical work okay? Do I need to do more work? What else do I need to fill in? Or if it's not viable, then I need to get a backup. And then I would just put that aside. The middle of the week, I would pull out the folder that I'd already worked from the beginning of the week before. And I would take all of that and handwrite. I, I don't know how to type, unfortunately. So I hand wrote all of my sermons with a pencil and a legal pad. So I'd write the whole thing out, and it's very rough and not at all the way it winds up being, but at least I know I've got the basic material on paper. Then I put that in the folder and put that aside. The end of the week, I pull out the file that has been now worked for two weeks, and it's, the rough draft is there. I make the adjustments. I write a final draft. And then, this is a critical element for me, my wife, Trisha, is an English teacher. And so I would read the sermon to her. And she would make any grammar corrections that I needed to make. Or if there were things that were not clear to her, 
more than likely they weren't going to be clear to the congregation. So I might have to rework some parts of that sermon. And by the time I had done that and I'm ready, then on the weekend, it becomes a matter of what I choose to call internalizing the material. And that system then took away the pressure of every week because I knew I was covered. I had a whole year's worth and I was doing it three weeks at a time and I knew that the work was unfolding. Now, if you go back and figure the hours, it usually took a total of about 25 hours to create a final sermon. 25 hours is a lot of time. Yeah. A lot of preparation. It is, but it's worth it. Because remember, I'm preaching the word of God and God demands that I do my best and give everything I can give to it. And then God steps in and makes it happen the way he wants it to. With that kind of responsibility, what is the hardest thing for you about preaching? The hardest thing about preaching, I, I suppose I would have to say, is that the hard work of preparation, because I, always, I, I literally felt I had to give everything I had to that preparation. The second hard aspect of it was terror. I have always been terrified to speak in front of people, uh, which is not exactly what you want to have as a preacher. So I would ultimately get to the point where I had to just simply throw my life and my sermon into the hands of the Lord. I know this will sound a little strange, but when I stepped into the pulpit to preach, I literally could feel a push in the back of my robe. And I think that was the Spirit of God assuring me it's going to be okay. Just get up there and let it rip. And that's, that's what happened. But the nerves were there always. In fact, I used to get nauseated before service. It took a lot of years to get over that. But the reality is, I'm getting ready to preach this next Sunday. And I'm terrified, just like I was then. And I still have the same dependence on the Spirit of God. Well, you mentioned the terror. We certainly don't see that it's sitting in the pews. There has a flip side, though. What is the most satisfying thing to you about giving a sermon? I think the most satisfying thing is, is to realize, first of all, that there's a congregation there of people who, who I know, whom I love, and people who are searching for the, the meat of the Christian gospel. And so that's kind of an exciting thing in itself. But then there's a supernatural dimension to preaching. And I think I can say it like this. The highest compliment I ever received was from a little lady in my congregation in Orlando who came up to me one Sunday and she looked me right in the face. This was after the service. And she said, who do you preach to when I'm not here? And I thought, ah, that's it. That's the highest compliment I've ever received. That, that's when you realize that the satisfaction is there. And you speak of satisfaction. I've had the privilege to be in the pews. I've also had the privilege of being in classes that you have taught, sometimes on Wednesday evenings at the church. Uh, what is the most difficult thing about teaching a class, and how is that different from preaching a sermon? Completely different, because it requires a different approach in terms of the, uh, the research, in terms of the knowledge base, in terms of what you're trying to communicate. A sermon is really relatively narrowly focused, but a class like that, you're going to be covering a wide range of subjects and ideas and biblical material in the course of that hour. And so it requires a completely different approach and one that uh, I enjoy, uh, but it, it's a different approach and it's one that I, that I feel like I'm, I've gotten better at as the years have gone on. And I certainly have gotten much more satisfaction in my own life because it's forced me to study and learn and dig deeper into the scriptures in ways that I would not have otherwise. And one of the great things about the website that you've created is that not only do we have your sermons, but we also can watch and attend your classes. Yes. That's great. Now you mentioned you started in Kilgore, Texas. Where did you go from there? From Kilgore, Texas, um, Trisha and I moved to Columbia, South Carolina, and I was the pastor at the Shandon Church there. Uh, each of my early pastorates were about five years in duration. Uh, we had a delightful time there. At that point in time, our children were very young, and so Tricia was not as involved in the day-to-day -day operation of the church as she had been in Kilgore and as she became later on. 
Uh, she was primarily a mother, and that was worked fine there. We moved from there to Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Ironically enough, she was born in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, but had not been back there in years and years. And so the Presbyterian Church there was a wonderful place uh, for us as a family to grow and for me to grow in my preaching ministry. And they, once again, gave me wonderful support. And then from Pine Bluff, I believe you moved to Orlando. Correct. And led the first Presbyterian Church there. That's correct. 21 years I spent at First Presbyterian in Orlando. It was an absolutely glorious journey. Um, it, it was not easy. Um, the, first, the church was about 1,200 at that point in time. They had a number of issues that were hindering the life of the church. It was right in the middle of downtown, and downtown Orlando at that point had become very seedy and uh, sort of corrupt, and having the church in the middle of that, and people were kind of afraid to come to the campus. Uh, so we had to develop a totally new approach to how to deal with that. And one of the things that we did was to work in partnership with the city and the county uh, to address the needs in downtown Orlando. But then also, uh, we took steps at the, at the campus of the church. For one thing, it was very hemmed in. We had to buy additional property so that ultimately we wound up owning a whole city block. Uh, and then we, we lighted everything. Everything was lighted so that people wouldn't be afraid to come there at night. And we, had, we actually had wonderful night watchmen who were there uh, during the day and during the night. The other thing that we did was to create what I call symbiotic programming, where we, we matched together different kinds of programs, but that would feed the, the ability of people to come down. For example, mothers would come down and drop their kids off at the weekday school, and then, rather than going home until noon, when they would have to come back, we had Bible study classes or exercise classes or card, bridge card lessons, that kind of thing, enabling them to build a fellowship and know that they were at least growing somewhat spiritually as long as they had their kids right there. So symbiotic programming became the secret. It was a lot bigger than just that one example, but it was it was amazing to see how that wound up overcoming people's reservation about coming downtown. A lot of people had to travel a long way to get to that church, but they came, and they ultimately came in huge numbers. In fact, didn't it become one of the largest churches in America? Yes, it did. So this symbiotic programming, how did that change the culture of the church and the church community? The culture had to change uh, primarily at the point of our basic theology. One of the things that we had to do was to make the decision to stay downtown. If we were going to do that, then it was going to mean that we had to alter a whole lot of things, including our belief that God wanted us downtown in Orlando and that God would bless that mission effort if we made the decision to do whatever we could to address the needs that existed in the downtown community but then reached out as well to the outlying regions around Orlando. And we did that primarily through different kinds of programming and we were, television became an important part of our ministry there. And the outreach from television drew people into downtown and the church wound up busting at the seams. It was quite a turnaround, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Then I understand you went later on in your life after you had retired to Manhattan, New York where a church that was nowhere near the size of the church in Orlando when you started or certainly where you, when you ended, why did you choose to go to Manhattan? Good question. Um, they approached me about coming there. I didn't know anything about the church at that point or what the circumstances were. And so they invited me to come up and just take a look. Well, when we got up there and took a look, it was uh, a little bit forbidding. It's a Gothic cathedral on Park Avenue and 64th in New York. Magnificent building, 10 stories high, and there were 14 people there. And it, 14 people employed? No, 14 people in the congregation. Wow. Hmm. The first sermon was to 14 yeah, people? Yeah, you could shoot a cannon through there and not hit a soul. <laughs> um, in any case, on the plane going back home after that visit, Tricia said, I don't think you're going to do that, are you? And I said, you know, the one thing I've never done in my ministry was start a church. 
there's a sense in which this would be starting a church in a Gothic cathedral. And that's exactly what it turned out to be. We went there. Uh, Tricia was my staff. We had six sextons, janitors, who took care of the building. They were wonderful. They were all from the South. They spoke my language and I spoke theirs, uh, but they were just great. And that was where we, we decided we're going to do something here. The Lord's got his hand on this. Those 14 people were convinced that God would not let that church die. And it didn't. And suddenly people started coming from all the five boroughs of New York. And ultimately, uh, they now have a dynamic young minister there, Jason Harris. Uh, they have three services, and that Gothic cathedral is jammed to the walls, mostly young people in New York, which is quite a sight to see. Congratulations. So you've really turned around churches in Orlando and in Manhattan. Well, that's the Lord turned the churches around. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. <laughs> now, you also served at, in Hilton Head and also in Houston. Yes. Tell us a little bit why you chose to go to Hilton Head. Hilton Head. Somebody has to suffer for Jesus. And Hilton Head is this paradise of a place. But the church there had been through a couple of ministers that it had been, it had been difficult. And the congregation had been kind of depleted to some extent. Wasn't as dramatic a turnaround, but... Uh, I did bring several years of kind of stable pastoral leadership there and hopefully some good pulpit work. And as a result, the church turned around and now they have a dynamic young guy there and the church is doing fine. Memorial Drive in Houston, fascinating place. The, the church was founded on the 50-50 proposition. That is, every dollar that comes in, half is spent on the congregation, the other half is spent on mission. And for 60 years, they have never yielded from that. And as a result, the things that church has accomplished, not only in Houston and this country, but the world, would blow your mind. And they still, to this very day, when you join that church, you know you're going to be engaged in the mission of the Lord in some way, shape, or form. And everything that you do is going to be half for the church and half for the work of the kingdom outside. In addition to sharing your word with the congregations in these various cities that we talked about, you've also written a couple of books. Uh, the first book, I believe, had to do with having the, a church in the city, perhaps based upon your experience in Orlando. Correct. Uh, a lot of times in the major cities in our country, churches right in the middle of downtown have gotten choked out for a variety of reasons. Uh, the situation in Orlando was turned around right in the middle of the city. And there were things that we learned there that I felt were worth sharing with other churches in similar kinds of circumstances. And so I wrote the book is called Downtown Church, The Heart of the City. And all of the lessons that were a part of that Orlando experience are incorporated into that book. And happily, the, the book has been used in seminaries and in large churches and denominational groups in a variety of different ways, helping to reestablish the presence of Christ in the center of big cities. Which is certainly a place where it's needed. Yes. You to consider the strife that's existing right. in so many cities and yes. the challenges in so yes. many cities today. What was the other book about? The other book is called The Forgotten Man of Christmas. Trisha and I, and I'll give you the background. Trisha and I lost a, a child, our son, John David. He was 22 years old, was killed in an automobile accident. This has been a number of years ago now. But we struggled to find a way to make his life count and to remember him and to allow the things that we loved and learned from him, uh, allow those things to permeate in other ways. Well, one year, uh, we were closing in on the anniversary of John David's death. It happened at Christmas time. And Tricia said, I think you need to write a book. I said, what? And she says, you need to write a book. You need to write a book about Christmas. John David loved Christmas like nobody else. And you know how he loved it. And I want you to find some way to communicate what Christmas is all about in a way that honors him. And so that's how the, the book came to be. It's a story of Joseph in the New Testament. Nobody pays any attention to Joseph. We all know about Mary. We all know about the baby Jesus and the shepherds and the wise men and the angels and the flight into Egypt, all that kind of thing we know about. But Where's Joseph? And I realized nobody's dealt with that. 
So I began to look into the Bible, and Matthew contains the story of Christmas from the perspective of Joseph. And it dawned on me that God communicated to Joseph in four different dreams, and each one of those dreams led to another significant step in the Christmas story. And so I began to dive into that in earnest. And then I, I suppose I should just say, with some sanctified imagination, I tried to imagine what life would have been like for Joseph under those circumstances. And so there are passages in the book that I entitled, How It Must Have Been, where I put myself into Joseph's shoes and try to think through what he was dealing with and how he approached the decisions he had to make. And through it all, he remained unbelievably faithful to God. He never questioned what God told him. Whatever God told him to do, he did, and he did it wonderfully. Quietly, he rarely, if ever, has anything to say. But, and you stop to think about it, Christmas could not be Christmas if it hadn't been for Joseph. Now, here's the personal wrinkle. Our three children are adopted. Joseph was not the biological father of Jesus. He was the adoptive father of Jesus. And so I began to find the parallels between my experience with the Lord and Joseph's experience with the Lord. And so that's how we wind up with a book that we hope elevates Joseph and draws people into the Christmas story in a new way, but also allows us to celebrate our extraordinary son. Thank you for sharing that story and that book with us. I mentioned the website. Why are you creating this website, your website, thewordmadefresh.org? Well, there's a lot, of, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears through more than 50 years poured into my life in the ministry. And it seemed to me that surely there are things and aspects of that ministry that are worth sharing with other people, even though I only preach occasionally now. And, you know, I'm in the last chapter of my life, and so I recognize that if, if any of this is going to continue, we need to find a vehicle for that to happen. And so my hope is that the website will serve a need for people. Pastors, it's, it's going to be free. You don't, uh, you don't pay for anything. If you want to give a donation, you can do that, but it, you don't pay for anything. And the, the reality is that there's a lot of stuff there, and now the, the creators of the website have, have, in essence, divided it up into different topics and areas of, of uh, interest, and you can just kind of click here and there, and you'll get things that feed whatever your basic need is now. And, of course, that's what my preaching was all about. I tried to meet the needs of the people who are sitting in the pews in front of me. And so this, I hope, will continue that. And it's my hope that, you know, whether you're a preacher or not, lay people can go there for devotional purposes. Sunday school teachers will find material there they can dive into. And I hope that that will serve as a resource for people who need to be continuing to deliver the great good news of Jesus Christ to the world around us. With respect to the name, the wordmadefresh.org, why did you choose that particular name? My uncle, Dr. Andrew Eddington, was a president of a Presbyterian college in Kerrville, Texas for a number of years, and he, he was a fa fascinating Bible teacher, laced with humor like you wouldn't believe. He decided that he would write a paraphrase of the whole Bible, and he decided that he would call it the Word Made Fresh. About that time, back in the early 90s, I was going to deliver a series of Wednesday night lectures on the, the Bible itself, taking it a book at a time. And I asked him to come and, and deliver the, the first lecture on Genesis, which was a riot. But in any case, he said, what are you going to call this series? And I said, well, I haven't thought about that. And he said, call it the word made fresh. You're doing what I'm doing, and it's in the family. Keep it and go. And so the, the word made fresh then became the title of that series of teachings, and then ultimately became the, the title of the website. And it also the thrust of many of your sermons that are in that website, I, I would say, dare say. Well, let's talk about the website uh, just for a moment. I see in the website that you have a category or a search assist, as you mentioned a moment ago, entitled Bible Verse. How would a website guest use that particular search assist? If, you, if you're looking for a particular passage, you just 
illuminate that passage, type it in, punch the button, and the sermons related to that passage pop up. Or if you're looking for a sermons on a particular book of the Bible or a particular uh, chapter of the Bible, all of those things are included in the sermon somewhere, and the website will help you to isolate those, bring them up, and let you feast on them. So, for example, at Christmas time, I could Luke 2, and I would get all your yes. sermons about yes. Christmas that yes. are tied to that. Another category or search assist is entitled series. What does that describe? Series are a number of times during the course of my ministry, uh, I would have standalone sermons, that is a sermon that was just one and one off, but then I developed a number of series of sermons so that I would take a Bible book, Philippians, for example, and preach through Philippians, or I would take a Bible character like King David or Moses and then preach a series of sermons on that. Then there are a number of series that are topical, like I have a number of series on relationships, on home and family, on the things that are occurring in the world around us, issues that divide us. There's a series on that. There are a lot of series that fall into different categories, and so the website will give you a list of those series, and then you punch on one, and all the sermons in that series pop up. And sometimes you may have as many as 10 or 12 sermons yes. in that series. Yes. Remarkable. Now, you also have uh, an entry called Topics. Can you describe what that represents? Topics are people who are coming to the website generally are coming out of the motivation of a particular concern in their life or an interest or a fascination. And so we wanted to create a list of topics that would give them the option of finding a topic that related to where they are and what they are looking for and then they punch on that and the sermons under that topic once again will pop up. So the topics become once more an entry into the whole library of sermons and teachings. So for example, if I'm feeling alone in the world, I can go to the website, yes. hit topics, and yes. there we go. And then I also saw something on the website that talks about events. What does that represent? Events, we decided to delineate uh, holidays in the, in the Christian year, high holy days, or seasons of the Christian year, like Advent or Lent. Then you have Christmas, obviously. Then you have Easter. You have uh, other high holy days in the Christian year. And those sermons are all categorized in those events. So if you punch on an event, you're going to get the sermons that are in that arena. There are also sermons on national holidays, 4th of July, Thanksgiving, all kinds of things like that. And those sermons, once again, will pop up when you press on that particular event. So it really makes it easy for even someone who is into technology in a very small way to be able to go to the website yes. and find what I need. I am totally inept, technologically speaking. And so the website has to be extremely user-friendly, and I think it's getting there. So you mentioned that this is a, going to be a user-friendly website. For whom is it designed? Is it, is it designed, for example, for ministers like yourself? Yes. Um, hopefully, pastors will, will draw some strength from it, some encouragement, some ideas, some thoughts, some stories, some uh, even some basic sermons if they want to do that and follow the, the kind of general outline that I have. Uh, that's, a, that's a part of it. Also, uh, people, once again, who are interested in their devotional life. Uh, you don't know that most people would think about sitting down and reading a sermon or listening to a sermon for their devotional life, but these sermons are targeted for people just like that person. And so it's very, very hopeful and possible that they would look to that. Teachers in Sunday school or seekers for the faith, people who are trying to learn more about Christ and the faith, uh, there are sermons that will be blocked out to encourage their understanding of Christ and their ability to relate to Christ and hopefully to come to faith in Christ. You mentioned teachers for a moment. Having been one once myself, I know it's very hard to find content. But if I understand you correctly, if I were to take one of your series, like the series on Philippians, I could then convert that into a multi-week Sunday school class? Absolutely. So you mentioned a moment ago the idea of also having designed this for people who are just searching for their Lord and Savior. Yes. 
How does that work? People who, who are at the outset of inquiry about the Christian faith, there are many, many sermons and teachings in there that will give them the basic understanding of who Christ is, what Christ does, and what the Christian faith is all about. And those are sermons that will be targeted for them, and they are teachings, and they can dive into those and begin at their own pace and at the Lord's pace to begin to discover in a way that might lead them ultimately to faith in Christ, which of course is my only goal and has been forever. And it looks like this is the perfect vehicle for carrying on that goal for years to come across the country. Well, we'll see about that. I'm, I'm willing to let the Lord take care of that. Great. It is wonderful that you created a website for you, meaning people that don't have a great deal of expertise yeah. on websites. And it's wonderful that you've been able to share your experience over all these decades as embodied in your sermons and in your teachings. As you look at this enterprise, what is your greatest uh, satisfaction in the creation of the wordmadefresh.org? I think my greatest satisfaction is that my 52 years in the ministry are not going to end with the end of my life. Um, if I stop to think about that, then it makes all of that work and discipline and study and research and everything else over all of those years more than worth it. And if the Lord can use that indefinitely, I will offer the, only the praise.